everybody. Welcome to week four. We're already in week four. Can you believe it? So I'm going to be taking role for the first three weeks. So you need to make sure you turn in your work uh, before Tuesday, which is tomorrow, the 25th. So make sure you turn in everything. Okay. So good job so far, everybody. Today, we're going to be looking at the next chapters, right? So we're going to be looking at seven and eight today. So let me go ahead and pull up eight for you. Oh no, okay. There we go. Okay, can you guys see it? No, it's frozen. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about researching your speech. So you can go to the library and because COVID happened, a lot of our research can be done online. So you might not be able to make it to the library in person and some libraries were actually closed for years. Some might even went out of business. So there is e-libraries, so you can go online to the library and a lot of times they have books that you can download for a week and then it disappears. You can even go to Google Scholar and you can uh, type in a word into the search engine and it can help you find what you're looking for. So today we'll talk about that. So this is about libraries are friends. You can even send out, you know, a lot of times they'll let you contact the librarian, let him or her know you're trying to get a book. Uh, these are some tips from some librarians here. So these are the tips that those librarians gave us. Your li librarian is just as knowledge about information resources and the research process as your professor in his or her discipline. So collaborate with your librarian so you can benefit from his or her knowledge. Try to learn from librarians so that you can increase your research skills. You'll need these skills as advanced for your academic coursework. You'll rely on these skills when you're in the workplace. When you're in offices, we aren't on reference desk duty. Whether an office door is open or closed, please knock first and wait to be invited in. With that being said, we are at the reference desk. We are there to help you. Please ask. You aren't interrupting. Helping students does not bother us. It's our job and our profession, and we like doing it. I'm here to teach you, not to bat for you, so don't expect me to write a note to your instructor because the material, reference, preserve, whatever aren't available. If it's not available, see if you can transfer it from another location. So when I was a student in my undergrad, which is my bachelor's degree, I went to a Cal State. I went to Cal State LA, and I remember I was doing some papers, and I was doing a paper on Bruce Lee, the Asian martial artist slash actor. And I was doing another one on Selena, which was a Latina singer slash performer. And I was doing autobiography for my Asian and Latino heritage class. And so I went to the library and they didn't have my book. No, I didn't get upset. I just said, is there any way that you could contact another Cal State and have them transfer the book here because I know that you can do that and the librarian said sure and then she says okay so in about five days I'll transfer a book for you to borrow from Cal State San Marcos and another one from like I think it was Humboldt State and you can borrow these two books and then bring it back as if you're checking it out and we'll send it back to them for you I said great so I did that so all you have to do is ask them if they could check uh, another sister library, you know, like another sister or brother library that they, they sometimes share references with and see if they can do that. Uh, you can also see if maybe they have an e-copy they can download for you or send to you. Sometimes if it's an article, they might want you to pay like $5 for printing of it. I mean, I know all this because I've done all of it. I paid before for them to print it for me. Like if it's an article I need for class, um, I used to sometimes have to pay for anthologies. So I would sometimes there, you could go to Kinko's or those places and they can download it for you. I remember one time I paid $27 for anthology of different articles I needed. And yeah, just ask. All they can do is tell you no, or they can refer you somewhere else to get your help. But don't 
make an excuse. If you need the materials, find out a way to get it. I know in the past I've got my materials and it was crazy, you know, because in the past we didn't have the internet when I first started college. And so, and then I was in the stage where we were going from the uh, regular brick and mortar, old fashioned uh, call numbers, old fashioned, um, you know, a floor of just articles from journals to everything being online. It's so convenient now it's online. You know, you save hours and hours of research time. And somebody's getting paid to organize it for you. So use it, you know, for the best you can. It should save you time. And we help you find sources. Please take a look at them and we more likely to help you find help in the future. Like I said, all they can do is tell you no. A research is a process, not an event. If you allocate enough time for your project, the librarian can, can't bail you out last time. So you should ask ahead of time if they have the book. That way it gives them time to get the resources, whether it's the book or the article for you. Don't wait till it's due tomorrow and say, I need the book today because they might have to call a sister library to get it for you. Don't expect the librarian to do the work that you should be doing as your project and as your grade. The librarian can help you with the resources, but you have to select the best sources for your particular project. This takes time and effort on your part. The reference librarians are professional researchers who went to graduate school to learn how to do research and reference librarians are there to help you no matter how stupid a student thinks his or her question is. And good research takes time. While others are shortcuts, students should still expect to do some time with the librarian and trawl through the sources they find. Students should know what we ask questions like, where have you looked for so far? Have you had a library workshop before? For this reason, it may sound like we're deferring the question, but we're trying to do a gauge how much experience the student has with the research and avoid going over the same ground twice. Students should approach the librarian and sooner rather than later, if the student isn't finding what they need within 15 minutes or so, they need to come find librarian. Uh, getting help early will save the student a lot of time and energy. If you don't have a well-defined topic, the research or you don't know what information resources are hoping to find, come to the reference desk with a copy of your class assignment. The librarian will be glad to help you to select a topic that's suitable for your assignment and help you access the research you need. Having at least a general topic in mind and knowing what the assignment Uh, entails peer reviewed only three different types of sources, etc., helps immensely. Most academic libraries are willing to schedule in depth research consultations with students. If you feel more need and attention than you might normally receive in the reference desk, or are you shy of discussing your research interest in public area, ask a librarian for an appointment. Students, if they are their topic, they should be specific as possible as what they ask for students who are struggling with identifying a narrow topic should seek help from either their professors or librarians. Uh, we can help you find sources if your topic isn't very clear. Students uh, need to learn that many questions do not have ready-made or one-stop answer. Students need to understand the interface with the reference librarian is a dialogue and a part of recursive, repetitive process. They need to make time for this process and assume the active role for exchange. Students should understand the information can come in a variety of formats. If a student asks a book about something without providing any details about the information needed, the student should come away empty handed. Instead, students should get the habit of asking for information about something first. Gee, thanks. Every now and then win the librarian's heart. Research can be fun. You know, you find a topic that you're interested in, maybe NASCAR driving. You know, I remember when I was in eighth grade, we had to do a paper and we were told we had to do it like on a sports figure. I'm not really much into sports. And I went to librarian and I asked, do you have any sports figures, preferably a woman I can do research on? And then she gave me a book about uh, tennis players. And then I was like, okay. So I ended up doing a book about tennis. And then when I was going into ninth grade, I asked my mom, can I, can I take tennis lessons? I'm kind of curious now. And then I fell in love with tennis and I ended up um, being on tennis teams. 
I mean, I wasn't like the best, but I was pretty good and I tried hard and it was a little workout. So, so it was fun. I did tennis, uh, for two years in no, no. Yeah. Three years out of four in high school. And then I ended up doing, uh, two years at community college. So I had fun. And then I used to play tennis with my friends for fun. You could do interviewing people. If you ever work on your uh, master's or your doctorates, or sometimes if you're in a program where you have to interview people for an assignment, I know in nursing, uh, they have nursing communication classes and they have to interview people in the field or patients. I know for teaching, you have to interview teachers for your credential. So there's different programs, you know, you might have to do interviewing or you might have a class that your teacher wants you to interview, maybe like interpersonal communication or psychology. So interviewing is a way to do research. Research is fascinating and a fun process because it allows you to find answers to questions, exposes new ideas, and can lead to the purpose of new activities. Primary and secondary source are quite common in the research literature. Primary research where the author has conducted a research him or herself, as secondary research as the author reports on research conducted by others. Hmm. Allowing time first and first most, you have a new project, no matter how long or small, it's important to seriously consider how much time that project is going to take. Uh, research matters. Research isn't just a one and done task. Practice or actual rehearsals on what you deliver in your speech out loud. You want to determine your needs. Like, what do I do personally know about my topic? Do I have any clear gaps in my knowledge of my topic? Do I need to conduct research on my speech? What type of secondary research do I need? Do I need research related to facts? Do I need research related to theories? Do I need research related to applications? The clearer you are about the type of research you need, an onset of research process, the easier it will be to allocate specific information. So make sure it's a peer reviewed. If you have to do like a, a research paper, it should be peer reviewed in a research article not like a magazine. If you're just doing like a basic paper, sometimes your teachers let you do magazines, you know, or like the, the newspaper articles, things like that. But if the teacher says it has to be a peer reviewed scholarly article, then yes, you do. Let me go ahead and show you Google Scholar. Let me show you, hold on. So I go right here and I'm on Google and I type in Google Scholar. And I'm gonna go to it. Then I'm gonna click on it. I gotta make sure I click on the section where it says um, articles. And then I type it in. Oh, so this is my dissertation right here. So if you click on this, you can click here, you can click here, and it's open to the public. So this is my dissertation. Now my DBA in business is located on uh, another uh, platform. And this, this is free for the public. My other one is a private one. And hold on one second. So for my research, when I did my dissertation right here, this is my PhD. This one had to be peer reviewed. Uh, this is my other one. This is my DBA. And like I said, this one is copywritten and is published on lulu.com. So that's the difference between the two. Okay, so I just want to share that with you.
And like I said, lulu.com is a private platform. So you have to like look up my name. It's not as easy as Google Scholar, but it is there. And then the next one I'm gonna show you is say we wanna do uh, 3D printing. Maybe I'm gonna do a presentation for my class on 3D printing. I'm gonna do 3D printing of fashionable clothing because now they make plastic shoes on 3D printers. Okay, good, you can still see it, perfect. So I have here 3D printing of clothing production. I wanna make sure it's the most current. Maybe my teacher said it has to be in the last two years, so I'm gonna put 2021. And now right here, it says there's 3,500 results. I also wanna make sure to include citations. This is a big topic. So here we go. Innovation application of the 3D printing technology and fashion design. And this would be considered a scholarly article it is taken from the Journal of Physics. So if my teacher said you need to use peer reviewed articles, I can find them here in Google Scholar. Uh, here's another one, creation of 3D printing fashion prototype with a multicolored texture, a practice-based approach. This is from the International Journal of Fashion Design, also a scholarly journal. Okay, so I just wanna show that too, because that's what a scholarly journal is. A lot of schools and a lot of libraries have their own, but like I said, you can always use Google Scholar if you're not able to locate your article or maybe the library that has articles. Okay, here's a little short video. This is six reasons why research is cool. Open the door to a new career with Penn Foster. Our affordable online programs prepare you for the essential jobs in demand today and in the future. Enroll to My job is cool. My job is the best job in the world. I am not an astronaut, I am not a rock star, I don't write bestsellers, I don't get paid to review the best restaurants in the world, and I'm obviously not a basketball professional player. <laughs> but I am a global health researcher. And by the end of this talk, my inbox should be full with all of your CVs, because you should all try and come work with me. <laughs> I'm going to give you six reasons, in case you need to be convinced. My job is cool because it allows me to be useful, plain and simple. How many of you can say the same thing? How many of you do something for a living that really has an impact in other people's lives? As a global health researcher, I spend all of my time squeezing my neurons, trying to figure out why poor people become sick. I try to find out innovative solutions to improve the health of those who most need it. This is a good reason to wake happy every morning and to be excited about what I do. My job as a researcher is cool because it forces me to think outside of the box. If you really want to have an impact, you need to think differently. And not only computer designers get to have this privilege. I'll show you two examples. Yos. Sorry for the picture. Yos is a tropical disease, one of those so-called neglected diseases, which means that nobody really cares about them. It is endemic in the Pacific and in some African countries. 
It affects mainly children and causes chronic ulcers. Okay, this disease will not kill you. But try walking around with this horrible thing in your leg. Not a good idea. Until very recently, Jos was treated with penicillin injections, something that is not very practical because you need to have trained personnel to administer the drug and because most sick children live very far away from the health posts. My friend Oriol, a brilliant doctor, came up with the idea of assessing whether a single oral dose of a very simple antibiotic called azithromycin could eventually replace the painful injections. EPAC, those are great. We tried this in Lihir, a small island in Papua New Guinea, one of the most remote places in the world, where one out of every 10 children suffers this disease. And bingo, it worked. Now this drug can be used massively to treat entire populations and eventually eliminate the disease. A simple idea, but a revolutionary solution to this problem. Malaria is another good example. Malaria is caused by a parasite that is transmitted through the bite of an infected mosquito. It kills an African child every 60 seconds. An effective vaccine against malaria could contribute substantially to reduce the burden of this disease. Unfortunately, it is not that simple. How do you test a vaccine in a place where people don't even have addresses? You don't have Travesera de Gracia 93 in a place like this. People challenge us and say that this would be an impossible task. But we've been successfully testing this vaccine for the last 10 years in a place like this, in rural Mozambique. And guess what? We are closer than ever to the first malaria vaccine, a major milestone in biomedical science. This vaccine could save the lives of hundreds of thousands every year. Research is also cool because you get to be in the media. The front page of the New York Times, that is so cool. But it's also so valuable. How much would it cost you to actually buy this space? We need the media to embark with us, to join us, to help us disseminate our messages. The media has the power to magnify our voices, to multiply our reach. We love the media. We need the media. By the way, 60 seconds have passed and another child has died of malaria. These should be front pages every morning also in the newspapers. Researching global health is also cool because you get to meet famous and powerful people. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it's not, it's not about glamour. <laughs> it's about commitment. When important people like Melinda Gates and her husband comes <laughs> to visit you. When they come to visit you at your workplace, you know you are doing the right thing. <laughs> we need the powerful and the famous to remain engaged, to help us advance the global health agenda. We must ensure that the needs of the poorest of the poor are taken into account. We need the famous and the powerful to share their influence with us, as Julie Dixon was telling us from Seattle. My job as a researcher is so cool that even working with the dead is exciting and worthwhile. Don't get me wrong, unless you are a Gothic, you don't really want to spend time with the death. But the dead can teach us many important things for the benefit of the living. A few weeks ago, I was in Manisa, a small village in the, southern, in the southern part of Mozambique. I had the opportunity of speaking with a mother who had recently lost her child. The child became ill at home and never reached the hospital. 
No one could tell what he had died of. The mother was desperately asking for answers, and I remained speechless. Isn't it amazing that in most poor countries, we still haven't got a clue what most people are dying of? How come haven't we managed to solve this very simple problem? How are we going to prevent future deaths if we're not evil even able to tell what are the most frequent causes of death. We need post-mortem science to guide us. We need to apply the technology in a field where research has also been dead for many decades. We need to develop the tools that could give us some insight on what people are dying of. The tools that may be applicable in places under different religious and cultural backgrounds the tools that could be used in places where full autopsies are impossible to perform. These are the tools that can provide real and actionable answers. I wish I had had those tools when I was speaking with that mother. And finally, research in global health is cool because it has allowed me to find love. <laughs> I am very, very lucky to have found somebody, someone that is as passionate, as committed to global health as I am. My partner, Maria, and I will soon be moving back to Mozambique, but this time we'll bring along some twin new responsibilities. <laughs> so to conclude, Let's move away from this silly idea that research can only be performed in a semi-obscure indoors lab by nerds and geeks. This is not true. Research can be done in the field where most major public health problems occur and are visible, where it can provide positive disruption into the lives of millions of people. So if you're curious, if you're relentless, if you are ready to embark in the most wonderful of the adventures, I need you to join us in the quest for global health solutions. What are you waiting for? You love it. <laughs> All right, so I am the visiting angel's caregiver. I have become a part of so many right. loving families. I okay. I made sure you can see it. Okay, so that was a great speech that he did on doing research. So you can see that doing research can be fun if it's a topic that you like. And he likes learning about diseases and learning about what medications can help people. We also have special needs periodicals you might be interested in looking at, like Business Wire, Sports Illustrated, Bloomberg's Business Week, Gentleman's Quarterly, Vogue, Popular Science, House and Garden, American Coin Op Magazine, Vermont. Hunter, Shark Diver Magazine, Pet Product News, International Water News, uh, Water Garden News, etc. These are like magazines and these are not peer reviewed articles. These are special interest periodicals, which is different. Like a lot of people can just write for them and be a journalist. You don't have to have a degree per se. You don't have to be a specialist, unlike the peer-reviewed articles. Those have to be uh, somewhat educational. They have to be done by researchers who have doctorate degrees and master's degrees. Now, some people have master's degrees and they work under somebody with a doctorate, which is different. You can see then these uh, specialist magazines. We also have blogs that a lot of people like to go to, like Huffington Post blogs, Gizmodo, uh, TechCrunch, The Corner, Mashable, Engadget, Boing, Boring Boing, uh, 
Gawker and Daily Beast and TMZ. I used to watch TMZ. They were really good. He's actually a former entertainer lawyer. We have search engines. I showed you the Google Scholar, which is under the Google search engine. But there's other ones like um, Yahoo, Bing, Ask, About Com, USGov, MedHunt, Medline Plus. Medline Plus is a good one. I actually teach in some nursing schools and they tell students to use Medline Plus. We have BizRate, Ameristat, Art, Cyclopedia, and FlipDoc. Scholarly books. College and university libraries are filled with books written by academias according to the text and academic authors association. Scholarly articles, computerized databases, scholarly information on the web. <clears throat> Finding information sources, curate a uh, research log. <clears throat> Note taking help. Software packages you could look into getting if you don't have the software. There's some examples here. You could start with information, basic information. If your teacher gives you a topic, you should probably define it and make sure you understand what the examples of it are because you want to make sure you're looking at the right, the right wording. You want to learn to skim. Read bibliographies and reference pages can evaluate sources, what's the date of publication, who's the author, who's the publisher, what is the quality of the biography reference page, do people cite the work, in conducting research for a speech, commit an adequate time and plan your schedule, consider both your research time, time spent gathering information, preparation time needed to organize and practice your speech, Get general idea of your speech needs before going to the library so you can take most advantage of the library's resources and the librarian's help. We live in a world dominated by information, but the information is filtered and some is not. It's important to know the difference between academic and non-academic sources. Non-academic sources are a good place to gain general knowledge of a topic. These include books, general and special interest periodicals, newspapers, and blogs and websites. We have academic sources. They offer more specialized, higher level information. They include books, articles, computer databases, and web resources. A fundamental responsibility is to evaluate sources you choose to use in order to ensure you're presenting accurate and up-to-date information in your speech. Make sure you always cite your sources. You want to give credit where credit's due. It's really important. If you don't do your citing properly, then you can be known as like a plagiarist. We have APA versus MLA citing. It is a little bit different, so you can always adhere to those uh, journal articles. There's some examples here. You can go to apastyle.com or the MLA. MLA stands for Modern Language Association. APA stands for the American Psychological Association. There is a website that I always tell students to go to. It is called purdueowl.edu. Okay, so, yep, you can see it. Okay, so it says OWL, Purdue Writing Lab. You just click on it. It'll have both citations, APA and the MLA. So you look right here. Most popular resources, Purdue OWL, APA formatting and style guide, MLA formatting and style guide, avoiding plagiarism, writing the basic business letter, and developing a resume. Okay, so that can help you with the differences. Moving down here, uh, use your sources ethically. So there are five ethical issues to consider. And like I said, you have to give credit where credit's due. What you should do is do your own work and use your own words. Allow yourself enough time to do the research for the assignment. 
Keep yourself on track for your sources. Take careful notes. Assemble your thoughts and make clear who's speaking. If you use an idea or quotation or paraphrase or summary, then credit the source. Learn how to cite sources correctly in both the body of your paper and your work cited or reference page. Quote accurately and sparingly. Paraphrase carefully. Research does matter. And do a patch write or patch speak. Do not do. Summarize, don't auto summarize. And do rework, do not rework other student work speech or by your paper mills or speech mills. Avoid academic fraud. Don't mislead your audience. Give credentials. Use primary sources. Style focus on components of your speech that make up the form of expression rather than your content. Social science disciplines such as psychology, human communication, and business typically use APA style. Mohammedi disciplines such as English, philosophy, and rhetoric typically may use MLA style. APA sixth edition and MLA seventh edition are the most accurate style guides and tables presented in this chapter provide specific examples for common citations for each of the styles. Citing sources within your speech has a three-step process. Set up a citation, provide a cited information, interpret the information within the content of your speech. A direct quotation anytime you utilize another individual's words in the format that resembles the way they originally said or written. On the other hand, a paraphrase is when you take somebody else's idea and restrate them as your own to convey intended meaning. Ethically using sources means avoiding plagiarism, not exchanging, engaging the academic fraud, making sure not to mislead your audience, provide credentials for your sources so the audience can make judgments about the material, Using primary research in ways to protect the identity of participants. Plagiarism is a huge problem and creeps its way into student writing and oral presentations. As ethical communicators, we must always give credit for the information to convey writing and our speeches. All right, before we go on to chapter eight, I have another video. This, is, this one's about supporting ideas and building arguments. So we've looked at the uh, Purdue OWL. I also showed you about Google Scholar. And this one's about how you can change somebody's mind. So maybe you want to use some persuasive strategies. You want to maybe use ethos, which is the ethics and credibility. Maybe you want to use pathos, which is emotional appeal. Maybe you want to use logos, logical appeal, and to persuade somebody. As experts in online education, Purdue University Global gives you all the flexibility Three people are at a dinner party. Paul, who's married, is looking at Linda. Meanwhile, Linda is looking at John, who's not married. Is someone who's married looking at someone who's not married? Take a moment to think about it. Most people answer that there's not enough information to tell, and most people are wrong. Linda must be either married or not married. There are no other options. So in either scenario, someone married is looking at someone who's not married. When presented with the explanation, most people change their minds and accept the correct answer, despite being very confident in their first responses. Now let's look at another case. A 2005 study by Brendan Nyan and Jason Reifler examined American attitudes regarding the justifications for the Iraq War. Researchers presented participants with a news article that showed that no weapons of mass destruction had been found. Yet many participants not only continued to believe that WMDs had been found, but they even became more convinced of their original views. So why do arguments change people's minds in some cases and backfire in others? 
Arguments are more convincing when they rest on a good knowledge of the audience, taking into account what the audience believes, who they trust, and what they value. Mathematical and logical arguments like the dinner party brain teaser work because even when people reach different conclusions, they're starting from the same set of shared beliefs. In 1931, a young unknown mathematician named Kurt Gödel presented a proof that a logically complete mm. system of mathematics was impossible. Despite upending decades of work by brilliant mathematicians like Bertrand Russell and David Hilbert, the proof was accepted because it relied on axioms that everyone in the field already agreed on. Of course, many disagreements involve different beliefs that can't simply be reconciled through logic. When these beliefs involve outside information, the issue often comes down to what sources and authorities people trust. One study asked people to estimate several statistics related to the scope of climate change. Participants were asked questions such as, how many of the years between 1995 and 2006 were one of the hottest 12 years since 1850? After providing their answers, they were presented with data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in this case showing that the answer was 11 of the 12 years. Being provided with these reliable statistics from a trusted official source made people more likely to accept the reality that the Earth is warming. Finally, for disagreements that can't be definitively settled with statistics or evidence, making a convincing argument may depend on engaging the audience's values. For example, researchers have conducted a number of studies where they've asked people of different political backgrounds to rank their values. Liberals in these studies, on average, rank fairness, here meaning whether everyone is treated in the same way, above loyalty. In later studies, researchers attempted to convince liberals to support military spending with a variety of arguments. Arguments based on fairness, like that the military provides employment and education to people from disadvantaged backgrounds, were more convincing than arguments based on loyalty, such as that the military unifies a nation. These three elements, beliefs, trusted sources, and values, may seem like a simple formula for finding agreement and consensus. The problem is that our initial inclination is to think of arguments that rely on our own beliefs, trusted sources, and values. And even when we don't, it can be challenging to correctly identify what's held dear by people who don't already agree with us. The best way to find out is simply to talk to them. In the course of discussion, you'll be exposed to counterarguments and rebuttals. These can help you make your own arguments and reasoning more convincing. And sometimes, you may even end up being the one changing your mind. Want to polish up your communication skills? Check out these lessons for more helpful tips. All right. So that was just a little quick video. I'll just keep on this side. Of All right, we're back on the chapter. We're supporting ideas and building arguments. Using research and support, we why we use support to clarify content, to add credibility, accuracy, does information within one piece, supporting evidence completely contradict other supporting evidence you've seen if the support is using statistic does the supporting evidence explain where a statistic came from or where it's determined? Does logic behind the support make sense? One of the book's authors recently observed a speech in which a student said the amount of pollution produced by using paper towels instead of hand dryers equivalent to driving a car from the East Coast to St. Louis. Uh, the second way to use support in building your credibility is to cite authoritative sources, those who are experts in the topic. In today's world, there are all kinds of people who call themselves experts on a range of topics. Is this person widely recognizable as an expert, yes or no? Does a person have appropriate degree, a training certification to make them expert? Does 
The strategies of public speaking can use, can provide collaborative evidence for a speech's central idea and specific purpose or call to support. There are three primary reasons for the support. Clarify content to increase speaker credibility and to make speech more vivid. A good piece of support should be accurate, authoritative, and current and unbiased. And these are some of the other references we can use. We have like an ex explanation here. Suppose that you uh, imagine you gave a speech to the president, veto your audience. It did not know the meaning of the word veto in order for your speech to be effective. Would you need to define what a veto is and what it does? Making sure everyone is on the same page is the fundamental task of any communication. As speakers, we often need to clarify and define what we are talking about to make sure our audience understands our meaning. The goal of the definition is to help speakers communicate the word or idea in a manner and makes it understandable for the audiences. The purpose is of public speaking. There are different types of definitions that may be used as uh, support. The faculty or power of speaking, oral communication, ability to express one's thought, emotions by the speech sounds and gestures. Uh, losing your speech made her feel isolated for humanity. Uh, act of speaking, he expresses himself better in speech than writing. Something is spoken, an utterance, a remark, declaration. We waited for some speech that would indicate our true feelings. A form of communication, spoken language made by the speaker before audience for a given purpose. A fiery speech, any single utterance of an actor in the course of a play, motion picture, etc., the form of utterance characteristic of particular people or region, a uh, language or dialect, a manner of speaking, mm -hmm. as a person, your suddenly speech is holding back your career. A uh, field of study devoted to the theory and practice of oral communication. Bicycle definition. We have a field of study devoted to the theory of practice of oral communication. Bicycle definitions are useful when the word may be unfamiliar to an audience and want to ensure that the audience is the basic understanding of the word. However, your ability to understand lexical definitions often hinders the idea with clear explanation of what it means in your own words. We have positive examples, cl uh, clarifying clearly, illustrate your principle, method, or phenomenon. Okay, we have other ones here. We have uh, persuasive narratives. You could use that, like use people's personal perspectives their personal experiences. Experiences are more powerful than perceptions. Perceptions may be, it happened to you, somebody you know, but if it's experience, it happened to the individual themselves. If you can't get experiences, you can always get perceptions. You know, where people's thoughts. We have expert testimony, eyewitness testimony. We have analogies, figurative analogies, literal analogies. Speakers often use facts and statistics to reinforce and demonstrate information. Ultimately, many speakers and audience members don't have a strong mathematical background. It's important to understand statistics used to communicate this information to the audience. Speakers use definitions. They may be lexical, persuasive, stimulative, or theoretical. Clarify messages, lexical definitions, state how the word is used in a given language, and persuasive definitions are derived to express a word or specific manner. Stipulative definitions are created when a word or a term is coined. Theoretical definitions attempt to describe the different parts of the idea or object. Positive, negative, non, and best help the audience grasp the concept. Positive examples are used to clarify or clearly illustrate a principle, method, or phenomenon. Non-examples are used to express something's not. Best example to show a best way somebody should have to behave in a situation.
Right. We have shifting through support using a variety of support systems. You can check for relevance. Don't go overboard. Don't manipulate your support. Don't overlook significant factors or um, individuals related to your topic. Don't ignore evidence that does not support your speech's specific purpose. Don't jump to conclusions that are simply not justified based on supporting the evidence you have. Do not use evidence to support a faulty logic. Do not use out of date evidence that's no longer supported. Do not use evidence in the original text. Do not knowingly use evidence as a support that's clearly biased. Make sure you cite all your supporting evidence within your speech. Using support of your speech. You can use different forms like uh, quotations, like what people said, quote unquote, put it between the, the lines that we have paraphrases, summaries, numerical support, and pictographical. So sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, here's some five tips for citing your quotations. This is a direct quotation. Uh, the author's words, witty, engaged, distinct, and particularly vivid. Use direct quotation when you want to highlight a specific expert of his or her expertise within a speech. Use direct quotation if you're going to be specifically analyze something that is said within the quotation. And if your analysis depends on the exact words of the quotation, it's important to use it in the quotation. Keep the quotations at a minimum. One of the biggest mistakes some speakers make is stringing together a series of quotations and calling it a speech. And remember a speech of your unique insight into a topic, not just a series of quotations. Keep quotations short, long quotations can lose the audience and connection between your support and your argument can get long. <coughs> like I said, with the pictures, use pictographic support when it could be easier or shorter for orally explaining a topic. You could use pictographic support when you really want to emphasize importance of the support. Make sure your pictograph supports aesthetically pleasing. You know, do warn them if it's going to be something that could be disturbing. Pictographic support could be easy to understand. It takes less than the use of words alone. And make sure everyone in your audience can easily see your pictographic support. If the listeners cannot see it, it will help them understand what they're supposed to help the speech to specific purpose. Oral presentation, setup. execution, analysis, summarize the support in your own words, unless you start with a summary, specifically tell your audience how the support relates to the argument and draw a sensible conclusion based on your support. We cannot leave an audience hanging, so drawing a conclusion helps complete the support package. Systematically think of the support you've accumulated in your research. Examine the accumulated support to ensure a variety of forms of the support are used. Choose appropriate forms of support depending on the speech context and audience. Make sure the support is relevant to specific purpose of your speech and your audience. Don't go overboard using so much support the audience is overwhelmed. Lastly, don't manipulate supporting materials. Speakers ultimately turn support materials into five formats. Quotations are used for another speaker or author's ideas and relay them to verbatim. Paraphrases take small portion of the source and use one's words to simplify and clarify any central idea. Summaries are used to condense an entire source into a short explanation of the source's central idea. And numerical support is used to quantify information from a source, picture graphics, or it helps audience members both see and hear the idea being expressed in the source. Use a reference outline to ensure that the main ideas are thoroughly supported. Start with the basic conclusion and then the work back, backward to ensure the argument supported at every point of speech. Uh, every claim within a speech could be supported while some experts can get away with not supporting every claim. Non-experts must show that they have done their homework and to present support in your speech, use a three-step process setup, execution, analysis. The setup explains who the speaker or the author is and provides a name of the source and relevant biographical information to the audience. Execution is the actual delivery of the support. Lastly, the speaker needs to provide analysis explaining how the audience should interpret the support provided. All right, so I have another video for you. Hold on one moment.
This is How to Use Rhetoric to Get You What You Want by Camille Langston. So I'm trying to get this commercial off. How do you get what you want using just your words? Aristotle set out to answer exactly that question over 2,000 years ago with a treatise on rhetoric. Rhetoric, according to Aristotle, is the art of seeing the available means of persuasion. And today we apply it to any form of communication. Aristotle focused on oration, though and he described three types of persuasive speech. Forensic or judicial rhetoric establishes facts and judgments about the past, similar to detectives at a crime scene. Epidictic or demonstrative rhetoric makes a proclamation about the present situation, as in wedding speeches. But the way to accomplish change is through deliberative rhetoric or symboleticon. Rather than the past or the present, deliberative rhetoric focuses on the future, it's the rhetoric of politicians debating a new law by imagining what effect it might have. Like when Ronald Reagan warned that the introduction of Medicare would lead to a socialist future spent telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. But it's also the rhetoric of activists urging change, such as Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream that his children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. In both cases, the speakers present their audience with a possible future and try to enlist their help in avoiding or achieving it. But what makes for good deliberative rhetoric besides the future tense? According to Aristotle, there are three persuasive appeals, ethos, logos, and pathos. Ethos is how you convince an audience of your credibility. Winston Churchill began his 1941 address to the US Congress by declaring, I have been in full harmony all my life with the tides which have flowed on both sides of the Atlantic against privilege and monopoly, thus highlighting his virtue as someone committed to democracy. Much earlier, in his defense of the poet Archias, Roman consul Cicero appealed to his own practical wisdom and expertise as a politician. Drawn from my study of the liberal sciences and from that careful training to which I admit that at no part of my life I have ever been disinclined. And finally, you can demonstrate disinterest, or that you're not motivated by personal gain. Logos is the use of logic and reason. This method can employ rhetorical devices such as analogies, examples, and citations of research or statistics. But it's not just facts and figures. It's also the structure and content of the speech itself. The point is to use factual knowledge to convince the audience as in Sojourner Truth's argument for women's rights. I have as much muscle as any man and can do as much work as any man. I have plowed and reaped and husked and chopped and mowed, and can any man do more than that? Unfortunately, speakers can also manipulate people with false information that the audience thinks is true, such as the debunked but still widely believed claim that vaccines cause autism. And finally, Pathos appeals to emotion, and in our age of mass media, it's often the most effective mode. Pathos is neither inherently good nor bad, but it may be irrational and unpredictable. It can just as easily rally people for peace as incite them to war. Most advertising, from beauty products that promise to relieve our physical insecurities to cars that make us feel powerful, relies on pathos. Aristotle's rhetorical appeals still remain powerful tools today. But deciding which of them to use is a matter of knowing your audience and purpose, as well as the right place and time. And perhaps just as important is being able to notice when these same methods of persuasion are being used on you. So from those videos we watched today, we can see how you can use rhetoric to persuade.
but sometimes the miscommunication does happen and this is how we can avoid it so when we are persuading people we never want to make them feel like we're forcing them to be a certain way we want to share with them how we can change their minds or we can show them the direction but it always is their choice whether they want to take it or not this is how for all the unconventional ways your team stays productive we've got furniture to position them for success because at office Sorry, depot office max our different. business is to keep business going buy online pick up in store or get free next business day shipping have you ever talked with a friend about a problem only to realize that he just doesn't seem to grasp why the issue is so important to you have you ever presented an idea to a group and it's met with utter confusion? Or maybe you've been in an argument when the other person suddenly accuses you of not listening to what they're saying at all. What's going on here? The answer is miscommunication. And in some form or another, we've all experienced it. It can lead to confusion, animosity, misunderstanding, or even crashing a multi-million dollar probe into the surface of Mars. The fact is, even when face to face with another person in the very same room and speaking the same language, human communication is incredibly complex. But the good news is that a basic understanding of what happens when we communicate can help us prevent miscommunication. For decades, researchers have asked what happens when we communicate. One interpretation, called the transmission model, views communication as a message that moves directly from one person to another similar to someone tossing a ball and walking away. But in reality, this simplistic model doesn't account for communication's complexity. Enter the transactional model, which acknowledges the many added challenges of communicating. With this model, it's more accurate to think of communication between people as a game of catch. As we communicate our message, we receive feedback from the other party. Through the transaction, we create meaning together. But from this exchange, further complications arise. It's not like the Star Trek universe, where some characters can Vulcan mind melt, fully sharing thoughts and feelings. As humans, we can't help but send and receive messages through our own subjective lenses. When communicating, one person expresses her interpretation of a message, and the person she's communicating with hears his own interpretation of that message. Our perceptual filters continually shift meanings and interpretations. Remember that game of catch? Imagine it with a lump of clay. As each person touches it, they shape it to fit their own unique perceptions based on any number of variables, like knowledge or past experience, age, race, gender, ethnicity, religion, or family background. Simultaneously, every person interprets the message they receive based on their relationship with the other person and their unique understanding of the semantics and connotations of the exact words being used. They could also be distracted by other stimuli, such as traffic or a growling stomach. Even emotion might cloud their understanding. And by adding more people into a conversation, each with their own subjectivities, the complexity of communication grows exponentially. So as the lump of clay goes back and forth from one person to another, reworked, reshaped, and always changing, it's no wonder our messages sometimes turn into a mush of miscommunication. But luckily, there are some simple practices that can help us all navigate our daily interactions for better communication. One, recognize that passive hearing and active listening are not the same. Engage actively with the verbal and nonverbal feedback of others and adjust your message to facilitate greater understanding. Two, listen with your eyes and ears, as well as with your gut. Remember that communication is more than just words. Three, take time to understand as you try to be understood. In the rush to express ourselves, it's easy to forget that communication is a two-way street. Be open to what the other person might say. And finally, four, be aware of your personal perceptual filters. Elements of your experience, including your culture, community, and family, influence how you see the world. Say, this is how I see the problem, but how do you see it? Don't assume that your perception is the objective truth. That'll help you work towards sharing a dialogue with others to reach a common understanding together.
All right, so that ends our session today. I do want to remind everybody, please, please do your assignments and turn them in by Tuesday. You need to do your assignments by Tuesday. I'm going to be giving a list of students who are not participating. So you need to make sure that you participate and that you turn in your work. Okay, so that would be tomorrow, which is the 25th Tuesday. All students who do not turn in their work will be notified to the school. Okay, so it's not that we're trying to be mean, we just wanna make sure that you're participating and everything's okay. Okay, and here's your little message, a reminder. Please, please turn in your work by the 25th, which is tomorrow, Tuesday. All students who do not will be notified at the school. Okay, thank you so much. That's it for today. Have a blessed and beautiful day and may God bless your week. Bye now.